Many of you probably recognize the gentleman there on my left, the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I am on the Federal Reserve Board. I serve on the Portland branch, which reports up to San Francisco. And it's been an incredible learning experience. Every month I travel to Portland, and the Fed has hundreds of economists. And each meeting, we are given a presentation from one of the Fed's economists. And the interesting thing about this meeting is it's not just listening, but we have this really robust conversation. And the value that the board members bring is we are really there to add to what the economists are talking about, really focusing in on the re regional level. But when you think about it, and Isa, uh, this is very respectful of what the economists are doing because they bring us great information. And then what we can do as board members is actually we are given questions that we are to ask business leaders in our local market to respond to. And so what we also add is kind of how are people feeling at the moment? And based on that, what are their behaviors going to be? So as I go through my presentation, I'm going to share with you information that those Fed economists have given me. But I'm also going to focus in on what some of the information is coming in at the local level from local executives. This recession was a very different recession, and it was a credit-driven recession. Basically what you had were banks writing off billions in losses, and as you all know, the credit markets really froze up. Companies, therefore, and individuals were hoarding cash because they didn't have access to credit. Corporations cut expenses, laid off employees, consumers stopped spending, and the economy was thrown into a very, very deep recession. The recovery from this recession is going to be a lot slower. And this particular graph in the gray band, you see we're starting and looking at all the recessions from 1953 to 1981. It starts in each of the recessionary times at time zero. And then it plots what the recovery pattern looked like in those recessions going from the first quarter and then the second quarter. And the thing to note here, the gray band is for all of those recessions from 53 to 81. The high level of that gray band is what the quickest recovery was. The bottom level is what the slowest recovery was. And you can see that the 2007 recession was not only much deeper, but is going to take a lot longer to recover from. So what's the Fed's role in management of the economy? The Fed really has just two mandates. The first mandate is to create an economic environment of stable prices. That's basically keeping inflation not at a zero level, but at a low level. Okay? So what you can see in the gray bands here are recessionary times. The Fed actually focuses on the core PCE inflationary level. You can see it declined during this recession, and it continued to decline. And what the Fed is expecting is that inflation is going to stay low at least through 2012 and into 2013 at about 1%. That's their expectation. We have a lot of conversations at our monthly meetings about inflation. And I'm not expected to agree. We're expected to really have, like I said, robust conversation. And there's a lot of disagreement, I think, in, in people's expectation of inflation. But the Federal Reserve's position is that there are some factors that are going to cause inflation to stay low, at least for a couple years. One is that manufacturing companies still have a tremendous amount of excess capacity. And so price, uh, competition is still really significant because of all the excess capacity and manufacturers wanting to utilize that excess capacity and having to charge lower prices as a result. And the second thing that the Fed believes is a reason why inflation is going to stay so low is because we have such a high level of unemployment. 
And so that also keeps wages from having inflationary pressures and growing. But the third thing, and this is what I mentioned in terms of the value of the board members, we have been uh, asked to report on what's happening at the local level in terms of prices and costs for several months. And in basically August of 2010, and again in January just last month of 2011, these are the kind of questions, these were actually two questions that were asked of us. To what degree are your company and industry facing downward or upward price pressures? And looking ahead over the next several months, do you expect prices in your business and industry to fall, stay flat, or increase? Okay, so what I do, I have about 60 executives in the Walla Walla and Tri-Cities market that I survey each month. And I'll share with you what their thoughts are, both looking at the August in uh, sort of the darker blue were the results, and then comparing that to what happened in the lighter blue just a month ago. 75% of the executives reported downward pricing pressure in August of 2010. That came to only 50% in 2011. 33% of the executives expected prices to continue to fall, and that was 10% in January of 2011. So with those two numbers, you can see that the pressure on prices to decline are less a month ago than they were last year. But the really interesting statistic was only 17% of the executives expected prices to increase in 2010, and today still only 45% expected prices to increase. So the majority of the people today are expecting prices to stay flat. Thus, this was very consistent with what we saw from other board members that were bringing information from the Northwest. And actually, we do see the results of these surveys across the nation. And it was very consistent at the national level. So with the Fed believing that inflation, at least for the time being, is going to be at that 1% level, then they are really focused, and a lot of our meetings are discussions about our second mandate, which is full employment, AKA low levels of unemployment. And so if you look at this chart, you can see that unemployment indicators and the unemployment rate peaked at around 10%. As you might well know, it fell to 9.5%. But it's been really, really sticky at 9.5%. Just last month, the number came in at 9.0. OK, but this is a tremendous issue for the Fed, because they do have these two mandates. They need to get down to a level of unemployment that is a target range of about 5 to 6%, and simultaneously keep inflation under control. And with their expectation that inflation is relatively controlled, this is the number one battle, basically, that they're facing. This chart actually looks at the number of jobs and changes in the number of jobs in the uh, national economy. When you're above the line in blue, that means jobs are growing. And when you're below the line in red, it means we're losing jobs. And this level of job loss relative to past in recessions is just a tremendous amount, over 8 million jobs lost in this recession. And there's some really troubling statistics that we look at. One is the level of unemployment in youth. Those people that are coming out of high school or recently graduated from college, it's in excess of 25% today. And when you drill down into that, what you find is a lot of the 75% that are employed are employed in jobs that are not consistent with the skills that those individuals have. You know, but they're out there, like my kids, just making sure they're paying the rent. At least I hope that's what they're focused on. <laughs> so I have a student, I have a son that graduated from Whitman College, you know, and, and today he's not exactly working in his profession, so to speak, but uh, he's putting enough money down so he's not asking us for extra monthly support, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs> anyway, so the second statistic that we focus on is the amount of time that the unemployed have been without a job. 
And today we lost, as I said, over 8 million jobs in this recession. Today, 6 million people have been out of work for more than six months. And that's uncommon too. Normally when you go through a recession, people will lose their job, but they're able to, because the economy comes back more quickly, they're able to get a job within three or four months. We've got a lot of families out there that are highly stressed because the primary uh, wage earner has been out of work for over six months. The Fed asks us questions on productivity and there's a real link I think between what we're seeing with productivity improvements and the economic recovery and this problem with uh, unemployment. We are in basically a jobless recovery and I really think it's linked highly to improvements that companies have seen in productivity levels. So looking here in May of 2010 versus last month, uh, January, some questions. Have you observed any notable changes recently in productivity or efficiency at your business? What were the sources? And going forward, do you expect the pace of productivity change at your business to speed up, to slow, or to remain stable? And I'll share with you what the answers were here from those 60 executives at the local level. 83% of the executives reported productivity improvements in May, and there were less that were still seeing ongoing productivity improvements, 66% in January. The productivity improvements ranged from 3 to 31%. And most of the executive survey expected those gains to be permanent. The common source of gains have been achieved through downsizing, outsourcing, and improvements in computer technology and automation. The kind of interesting statistic to look at, because remember one of the questions were, do you expect your pace of improvements in productivity to speed up, to stay the same, or to decline? In May, it might look like I just forgot to put the number up there, but in May on that answer, expect to speed up, 0% of the executives expected the pace of productivity improvements to actually speed up. But interestingly enough, in January, just a month ago, over 50% actually expect the pace of productivity improvements to increase. And I think what we're seeing is businesses were under such stress in this recession that they actually had to take some pretty aggressive actions and they've taken aggressive actions not only from laying off workforce but also using technology, making people work harder, whatever they can do to try to cut their expenses. And the expectation now is that is a process that people are really going to continue to take advantage of. So even as the economy recovers, those companies are not willing to give up their productivity gains and that means that there are fewer and fewer jobs that are going to be brought back on as we have this economy recovering. There are some really bright spots in the fundamental pinnings of our economy. We are definitely in a recovery. Uh, retail sales continued to grow in December. Um, but the number one risk factor, so I, I'm gonna, I could make this a longer presentation by showing you all the really positive things that are improving in the economy, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of really positive things. So I don't want this to be a downer presentation, but I know for this audience that you're probably most interested in the housing market, and so in our meeting in January, not the last one we had in February, but in the meeting in January, we re really focused in a lot on housing. So I thought I would share those graphs with you and we can talk a little bit about this. Single family housing starts and permits. One of my board members uh, is the president of Gelwin uh, Windows and whenever the economist says it looks like things are improving, he always stops and says, can't you see we're bottom and we are just bottoming, bottoming, bottoming. Now his production of windows is much greater than even just the Pacific Northwest. And so while this area is certainly not seeing such a negative impact, for his business, because he produces uh, windows for the country, and I'm even pretty sure he has a fairly decent 
uh, international distribution of Windows, you know, he basically is saying we are still very much in the bottom. Home sales remain low. This is existing home sales in blue, which you see, can see declined rapidly and kind of hit a bottom in the recessionary time frame. We had the first time home buyer's credit, which seemed to improve that. But once that went away, home sales declined dramatically again. We are seeing some improvement, but new home sales, and I'm assuming that's related to the fact that across the country, the production of new homes or the building of new homes is so low, there aren't new homes to sell. Uh, but this is a really uh, clear indication that in the housing market, things are not recovering nearly as rapidly. So my question to you, because I always like to learn, what are you seeing here in the local level? As you look at existing home sales, as you look at new home sales, what has the local experience been through the recession and particularly what's going on today and what are you expecting to have happen in the next six months? Anybody willing to kind of give me some sense of what you're seeing? I think our biggest challenge has been um, that we do have a fairly stable economy. So convincing the banks that you do need to lend money to the builders Yep. They, they do have people ready to buy, so it's still very closed off. We're still fighting that here. And so for us, that's our challenge. Yeah, I can understand that. I will say that, you know, Baker Boyer, um, I'll give a little plug here. We've been really successful through this recession. Um, and actually, U.S. Banker looks at all of the community banks across the country and ranks them. And we've been in the top 200 uh, three consecutive years in a row, and last year we were number 44. And our market share growth has been very substantial. Uh, so the good news is, and we went through the Great Depression. I've got telegraphs that came in from the Treasury that were calling all of these subs uh, consecutive um, mandates to change our practices and finally close the door. And the good news is we operated out of the alley at that time, actually. Today I might be put in jail. I might have a little bit of problem doing something that I'm told by the President of the United States not to do, but anyway. Um, but I hear you, because the banking industry is still very much struggling today. We're still closed up. We're still hoarding. And, 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 and in Washington State, there are only three states that have a um, banking industry that is under more stress than the state of Washington. Any other comments about what you're seeing in the local market? OK. Uh, what, Megan, what, what percentage of, of our business is new construction, guys? About 30. 30%. 30%. About 30%. That's phenomenal. Okay. Very different metric. Actually, I need a pen. My memory is so bad. Thanks. That's a good statistic for me to share at a meeting. Do you all agree to that, 30%? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. OK. Other comments? OK, continuing on looking at housing, here is a graph of really the pricing bubble. So we see some recovering and recovery nationally in existing home sales, but there's still a lot of stress in terms of prices of homes. And the top markets up there, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, those are the markets where actually you can see prices are starting to recover a little bit. But, and those are the four markets that have the highest percentage increase. It was back from October 2010, year over year increase in the housing price. The markets down here are the markets that have the most decline, the severest decline in pricing. And you've got Miami, Tampa, Seattle, Charlotte, Portland, and Atlanta. So the interesting thing there is our neighboring markets of Seattle and Portland, from a pricing standpoint, are some of the most stressed today. Probably another statistic, Jeff, that would be interesting, you know, when we think about what's happened to prices here in the Tri-Cities. How big was your bubble? Small. Yeah, small, right? We and I'm. We didn't have any. Yeah. 
Very and, nice. and the thing that hurt more than anything was people seeing all these really bad statistics. Made them nervous. Yeah, made them nervous. The yeah. fear factor. And you know, that was so consistent. Think about what happened in the stock markets. There was no rationality. We have our wealth management practice is actually twice the size of our banking assets. And there, when we looked at uh, what was happening in some of the prices of companies, we saw that there were companies that had more cash on their balance sheet than the market value when you looked at the number of shares and the price. That was ludicrous, and it was a fear factor. And I'm sure it affected this market too in terms of the housing. Where are you today in terms of the direction of prices? Is it flat? Is it growing? Depends on the price range. Higher end, still kind of flat. Lower end, growing. OK. This is another issue which will just continue to challenge the market recovery and prices because the level of foreclosures and what we're expecting to see even in the next say 6 to 12 to 18 months is a significant number of continuing ongoing foreclosures. Basically in Washington and Oregon 14.3 percent in Washington of the homes have an equity value that is below what they have in loans on that house. Okay? And unfortunately, Washington and Oregon um, are, you know, not, we're kind of in the mid range there, although the national average is 23% of the homes nationwide have an equity value that's lower than their loan value. Hey, we, uh, I think we're just in the USA Today, right? Where we were um, only 4.3% of our. Uh, homes here are have more loan on it than they do the value of the home. 4.3 percent. We're like number seven, seventh lowest. Okay, and um, and, and um, Sharon, in, our, in your report that you put out, um, I believe that, that Sharon puts out January our uh, foreclosures were lowest since what? Um, what to oh five oh something like that. So whatever your first line is, it was like five or six years ago. So it was the lowest great. for the month. So. We're very fortunate. I, I was just going to say, I mean, this has been one of the most interesting things for me as I've gone, you know, what a, what a fascinating time to be sitting on the Fed and going through this recession. And what I report consistently is so different. Most of the board members that I um, am serving with are from the Portland market. And what a difference of the information. Yeah. Steadily increasing, yeah, on a whole. Okay, so I'm going to skip that one from now. So the recovery is continuing, but they're the headwinds. The headwinds have to do with high levels of unemployment. Um, the headwinds have to do with businesses that are improving, but they're reluctant to hire. The headwinds obviously have to do with the housing market, and we do spend a lot of time talking about the housing market. I think one of the good news is that the leading economic indicators here in blue uh, are not indicating that we're headed for a double dip recession. That would be, again, one of those factors that would really increase a lot of fear again and I think would cause a lot of then subsequent bad things to happen. Uh, so the leading economic indicators actually started turning uh, at the end of 08 and you can see today now the current economic indicators are showing progress. So there isn't an ex expectation of a double dip recession. The recession officially ended in June. Leading economic indicators, as I said, don't indicate a double dip. Fundamentals of the economy are improving. And GDP growth was the highest uh, in the quarter of uh, last quarter of 2010 that we've had since 2006. The Fed is using long-term and short-term interest rates to management to stimulate the economy and avoid the risk of a double dip. And this should help support the housing market, which is the number one risk to economic retraction. So those are kind of what I have to share with you, my comments. Any questions? Any further discussion? Yeah. So you talked about uh, inflation staying low. But what happens once the economy starts to recover and people start getting jobs again? What's expected to happen? 
I think everybody, even the Fed, understands that the both uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus have the expectation that inflation will come back. And so the expectation is what the Fed is going to have to do at the time we start seeing, and they're not expecting this to happen, as I said, until 2013. But then they're going to have to start taking the measures that they have in their toolbox to cool down the economy. And I know Ben Bernanke personally says that he's so concerned not about inflation, but deflation and a double dip recession happening. If you don't mind me just making a comment about deflation. So when you have prices falling in manufactured goods, then companies' margins decline. They have to cut costs. They lay off more people. Or they come to their employees and say, you got to take a 10 15% cut in pay. That then affects people's ability to make their mortgage payments and other things. And so what happened in the Great Depression, and Ben Bernanke is a real um, scholar of that, is we went into a deflationary period, and that just really took a spin. If the banks end up not having uh, clients that can pay their mortgages back and other loans back because businesses' margins are falling, then the banking industry just continues to get weak. And so I think there's no doubt Everybody understands inflation pressures are there, and the Fed believes that when that starts happening, they've got the tools to manage inflation, cool down the economy, but they're just so fearful. Even though maybe it's only a 5 or 10% chance of deflation, that would be so damaging that they don't want to take the risk. So does that mean interest rates will go up? <laughs> I think interest rates will definitely go up. Yeah, and when. You know, the really crazy thing about this recession is, and I, and, and, you know, I see you may be able to share with this, but the norms just aren't applying, you know, when they look at the statistical expectations. So it makes it even more difficult to project. Yes? What do the uh, forecast for foreclosures? That's the key to this whole thing. Yeah. I don't know what that's going to be. That thing is still down. I think because of what I know in terms of the banking industry and what not our bank but what, what the average kind of level of um, properties in Oreo that have to then go out on the market and when you're a bank your only interest is just to sell it quickly so I think your comment is very very to the point um, this housing market still is going to suffer quite a bit because of a huge inventory on banks of foreclosed properties. And I see on, uh, on self employed here, in the construction business, they go to Vancouver, let's say just an hour old family or bottom in the construction business. Yes. And I'd say probably uh, four out of ten. Mm -hmm. They're Absolutely. Absolutely. These are very close to being and, and what's happened, again, the fact that this recession is taking so long to recover causes businesses that even as they went into the recession to be fairly healthy, the length and depth of the recession is causing a lot of, and particularly, like you say, builders uh, to have real severe pressures. I think the, the major banks are really trying to speed up the foreclosure process to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, to make that happen quickly. Get through this time frame. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then you know that we had the hiccup as far as their process, and so then there became big legal issues, and you know, what a mess. Maybe one more question? Yeah. My question is how do you get two economists to agree on this thing? <laughs> well, they don't. <laughs> And in fact, the, cra the funny thing is, you know, we have a different person pretty much each month, and, um, and they don't agree. But that's probably healthy. And I, what I really appreciate about serving on the Fed is they're not expecting me to come and bless what they're thinking or bless their policies. Um, they're expecting me to come and voice my opinions, and I bring and represent all of the interest of this local area to those discussions. And, 
you know, even when I met Ben Bernanke, it became really clear that the Federal Reserve governing board members in Washington, D.C. do value hearing from board members at what's going on at the local level. So anyway, thank you again for allowing me to come and talk to you. Thank you. Yeah.